the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the community of the Holy Spirit be with you all. As you are able, please stand and together we'll say our call to worship and join in our opening hymn. All creation is filled with God's Spirit. The breath of God's very life. God is love. The source of healing and peace. When we feel dry and parched, we rest, we rest in, in the, the promise, promise that, that God will restore, restore us. We sing uh, Oh for a Thousand Tongues to sing number 374. Welcome to this gathering of community in the spirit of Christ. Welcome to our ongoing Lenten journey of seeking. This week we are confronted by death, grief, and despair, but are reminded that God breathes new life into what seems hopeless and lifeless, lifeless and this is good news indeed. We are grateful for your presence with us, whether in the sanctuary, live streaming, listening in on radio, or watching later on YouTube. You are part of this community of faith. Our prayer has already begun, but we continue with some words. Life-giving God, your creative love and energy surround us renewing and regenerating creation that continues to evolve. New life confronts us. We notice signs of spring and the profusion of summer growth, the abundance of autumn and the tenacity of life in winter. We praise you for a world of beauty and wonder that reflects your care and faithfulness. Yet we also are confronted by death. Accidents and disease separate us from loved ones. Forest life and farmland are destroyed by industry and development. Cultures and languages disappear and people lose their sense of identity. We acknowledge the grief and anger that are often a part of loss. We wrestle with unanswered questions and feelings of despair. We own our tendency to give up on faith when life no longer makes sense or to attack the people who seem to be responsible. We remember Jesus who declared, I am the resurrection and the life, yet wept at the death of a friend. Come, O Spirit, bring us comfort and courage when death stares us in the face. Come, O Spirit, give us strength and new energy to resist the powers of destruction and despair that can undermine life. 
Remind us that you never give up on us, that you breathe new life into tired bones, that you hold hope for us. God of Jesus, who shared our humanity, keep us company on this Lenten journey so that we may find the path of life. Guide us as we join now in praying like Jesus taught us, saying, Eternal Spirit, earth maker, pain bearer, life giver, source of all that is and all that will be, our divine parent who is among us, blessed be your creation. May your realm be a reality here on earth. May we become more interested in building your kingdom here and now than in waiting for it to come down from above. Let us share our bread with those who are hungry. Let us learn to forgive as well as to receive forgiveness. In times of temptation and test, strengthen us. From trials too great to endure, spare us. From the grip of all that opposes life, wholeness, and peace, free us. For ours are the eternal blessings that you pour upon the earth. All that we do in your love, all that your love brings to birth, and the fullness of all that will be are yours now and forever. Amen. Friends, no matter how much we ignore God or push God away or try to solve the world's problems all on our own, God would still love us all the same. Even in our shortcomings, we are God's beloved. So listen carefully to the good news. We belong to God and we are not alone. Thanks be to God. May the peace of Christ be with you all. I invite you to share the peace of Christ with a peace sign or gestures with those around you. part of the service where we exchange peace. It's a symbol of who we can be, who we're trying to become as a, as a community of faith, one that lives in peaceful relationship. Doesn't mean there aren't struggles. Doesn't mean we don't have bad days in Christian community. Doesn't mean there aren't people we dislike. But we can still try to lean into love. We can still try to lean into peace. Um, if there are young folks who want to join me at the front, you're welcome to come down. I've got a song I wanted to teach you all today. This song might be new to some of you, um, and some of you bigger people in the back, I think, have heard this before. Well, uh, let me ask you a question first. Do you ever have a bad day? Who here has had a bad day? Huh? <laughs> have you ever had, like, a bad stretch of days? Like, a long... <laughs> yeah. That's, what, that's a part of life, isn't it, when we have really bad days? Well, there's somebody uh, who lived a long, long time ago, and this person's name was Micah. Micah lived, hmm, about 2,000 and, I don't know, 600 years ago or so. And Micah lived at a time when things were really hard. He was having some really bad days, and his people 
in Israel were having some really, really bad days. Uh, there were lots of poor people who had nothing to eat, and there were those who were trying to help them, and others who really didn't care. Uh, people were not very nice to each other. Uh, there, was, there was an enemy army just down the road with soldiers approaching, and everybody was afraid. Uh, it was really, really hard days. And Micah, Micah asked himself, what can we do in response to, to the bad days that we're living in? What, what is one thing that I can do to help? And the answer came. The answer came, maybe, maybe it was God who gave him these words. And the words were, here's what you need to do. You need to, what are the words, MC, the first line is, the song, this is the song, what does the Lord require of you? Justice, to seek justice, justice and love to love kindness, kindness and, and to walk, walk humbly. humbly with our God. Sometimes in a really, really bad day, that's a good thing for us to remember. What does the Lord want us? How does the Lord want us to live? How does God call us to be in relationship with one another? Well, to seek justice, which means to maybe find ways to help society so that we don't have poor people. <laughs> That's one thing. To, to seek justice, to love kindness. Ooh, I love that one. Imagine if the world were just a little bit kinder and when we felt like growling at somebody who annoyed us, just stopping for a moment and breathing and thinking, you know what? The world needs a bit more kindness. Imagine if we all did that. We can try. And to walk humbly with God. Well, what does walking humbly with God mean? I'll let you think about that one. Yeah. So the, the song goes like this. And the word, the first line is, what does the Lord, what does the Lord require of you? What does the Lord require of you? It just comes down and then has a little jump at the end. I'll stand up so everybody can see my hand. What does the Lord require of you? What does the Lord require of you? I think you can do that a little bit louder. What does the Lord require of you? Yeah, that's nice. Of you. So, when we come to the song, I want a whole bunch of you to sing that part. But if your voice is a little bit lower, then you can sing this part. And, and the words are, Justice, kindness, walk humbly with your God. Justice, kindness, walk humbly with your God. So you're just stepping down and then come up and down at the end. Justice, kindness, Walk humbly with your God. What's the first line? What does the Lord require of you? What does the Lord require of you? Justice, kindness, walk humbly with your God. Now, if you have a higher voice, I love this part. This is to seek justice to love kindness, to walk humbly with our God. To seek justice and love kindness and walk humbly with our God. Do that again. To seek justice and love kindness and walk humbly with our God. So we're going to do this as a round, or as a, as a what do you call it? We're going to mix our parts. We're, we're singing three parts here. So those of you who want to sing, though, what does the Lord require of you? We'll sing that through once, and when we finish that, just keep singing it, okay? So the end will sound like, what does the Lord require of you? What does the Lord require of you? What does the... Just keep the beat there and keep singing it. Second time through, we'll bring in the lower part. And I'll give you the note, just listen for what I do, and I'll sing that part with you. When you get to that, sing it through, and just keep singing that part. Third time through, we'll do the high part. Are we good to go? Yeah. I love this. <laughs> so whoever wants, just pick your part. What does the Lord require of you? What does the Lord require of you? Ja, ja.
together, God's people say amen. Oh, fun, fun, fun. Femi is going to uh, lead you out to the church school. It was great, great to sing with you today. Thank you, thank you. Yay, that's how I feel. Yay. Awesome. Why is bad news so loud? In the midst of violence, hunger, mighting, melting ice caps, and anxiety, it often feels like suffering has a microphone. How do we hear you, and how do we find you? How do we know that these bones can live? Today, we bring our raw selves into this space, asking that once more you would rush through this room like a mighty wind. Remind us that these bones can live. Speak to us in your still, small voice and let it be loud enough to speak to the sorrow of the day. We know that good news rests in you, and we know that you are here. So help us listen, not to the bad news of the day alone, but to the hope that you breathe into every word. With open hearts we pray, amen. The Logos Junior and Senior High have been working in worship arts to create this banner as a visual representation of our seeking journey. The symbol for the seeking in our series is an eye. Each week, we are adding another symbol to the seeking logo that represents each step on our Lenten seeking journey. On the first Sunday of Lent, we added the drop of mud, and on the second Sunday, the curved line, which represents the vessel, which represents the veil, and on the third Sunday, the vessel, and on the fourth Sunday, the star. Today, on this fifth Sunday of Lent, we add the symbol of a drop of water. The water references the many times water is mentioned in our Lenten scriptures this year. Jesus tells Nicodemus he must be born of water and spirit. Jesus asks a Samaritan woman for a drink and offers her living water. 
Jesus meets the blind man at the pool of Siloam, and when Jesus washes the disciples' feet. In today's story from the Gospel of John, the water drop references a tear as Jesus, Jesus weeps at the mouth of his friend Lazarus' tomb, and on the morning of the res resurrection of Jesus, when Mary weeps at the mouth of Jesus' tomb. As we listen to the reading of scripture and their interpretations in our wondering time, may our journey of seeking be deepened. Our prophetic reading comes from Ezekiel chapter 37, verses 1 to 14. The hand of the Lord came upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me all round them. There were very many lying in the valley, and they were very dry. He said to me, Mortal, can these bones live? I answered, O Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, Prophecy to these bones, and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. I will lay sinews on you, and will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I had been commanded, and as I prophesied, suddenly there was a noise, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. I looked, and there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophecy to the breath, prophecy, mortal, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, a vast multitude. Then he said to me, Mortal, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say, Our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. We are cut off completely. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, I'm going to open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you back to the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people. I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live. And I will place you on your own soil. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken and will act, says the Lord. This is one of our sacred stories. Thanks be to God. And the gospel reading for the day is brought, is read from the gospel according to John. John's stories are quite long, tend to be, uh, but they're so rich. Listen for what the Holy Spirit might be trying to teach the church, might be trying to teach humanity. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha, Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent a message to Jesus, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. Rather, it is for God's glory, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Accordingly, though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, after having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, those Jews were just now trying to stone you, why, and you're going to go there again. Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours of daylight? Those who walk during the day do not stumble because they see the light of this world. But those who walk at night stumble because the light is not in them. After saying this, he told them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he will be all right. Jesus, however, had been speaking about his death, but they thought that he was referring merely to sleep. 
Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. For your sake I am glad that I was not there, so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Thomas, who is called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let us go, let us also go, that we may die with him. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now, Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him while Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. When she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, The teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come to the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. Those Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary get up and quickly go out. They followed her because they thought that she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. So the people said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there's a stench because he's been dead for four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus looked upwards and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew, that, I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he'd said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth, and his face wrapped in a cloth. And Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. Many of the people, therefore, who had come with Mary had see and seen what he had did, he had done, rather believed in him. This is the witness of the early church. Thanks be to God. So Easter's not for two more weeks. Easter Day... Resurrection Day, is supposed to come to us as a, as a surprise. I mean, if we imagine ourselves in the story along with those disciples on our way to Jerusalem, we're not supposed to anticipate resurrection. We're supposed to be with the women arriving at the empty tomb on Easter morning, find it empty, and then surprise, marvel at this good news. So why then does the lectionary, which is a three-year cycle of scripture readings, which Courtney and I use to choose texts for Sunday services, why does the lectionary present us with these texts today? These texts are about resurrection. Don't these texts kind of spoil the Easter Sunday surprise? Well, yes, there is resurrection in these stories. But there's also a lot of death in these stories. Ezekiel sits amid a pile of dried human bones. 
Lazarus is stone cold, laid deep in his tomb. Not very pleasant things to think about, these deathly things. None of us enjoys death talk because, quite frankly, death frightens us. Death is about change. Death is about separation. Death is about an ending. So most of the time, we do our best to avoid thinking about death. Let's save the death talk for the funerals, would we? But maybe it's good for us to sit and think about death on a day when we don't have a funeral. Because I believe that despite our best efforts at repression, most of us, probably all of us, carry with us a fairly constant sense of our own mortality. Open the newspaper any day, there'll be lots of stories and articles where there's a death of someone <laughs> somewhere. We grieve these stories because they make us painfully aware of our own fragility. We grieve our own mortality when we grieve the death of another. Death is everywhere, and the reality of death stings. Maybe that's why Jesus wept when he went to the grave of his friend Lazarus. We often associate these tears of grief, these tears of Jesus, rather, with feelings of compassion and grief. We read that he was deeply moved, and so we sentimentalize the scene. Even the people around Jesus assumed that he was crying out of sadness. But the Greek word that's translated as deeply moved also carries with it connotations of anger. So then is Jesus weeping for Lazarus alone? Or could it be that Jesus is weeping for all humanity because of the pain that death causes in human life? Into this story of decay and pain and finality, Jesus arrives, comes walking down the road, right up to the graveside, right into the midst of these wailing mourners. Why? Because Jesus is ticked off at death. Our story today is not really about Lazarus. Lazarus doesn't say a thing. He doesn't do anything. No, this is a story about a conversation that Jesus has with his friends on the subject of death. Now, in the story, it seems that Jesus walks onto that scene of death about four days too late. Jesus, rather, Lazarus was really dead. Now, it was a common belief at the time that when someone died, the spirit of the deceased hovered around the body in the grave for three days after death, hoping to re-enter the body. But after the third day, that spirit left the body for good. That was the belief of the day. Well, in our story, it's no accident that we are told that it was the fourth day. Lazarus was really dead. When Jesus arrived and Sister Martha ran out to meet him, she kind of let Jesus have it. Lord, if you'd been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Now listen to this conversation. It's interesting. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Well, of course he will, Martha replied. She, like the Pharisees, believed in this relatively new notion of the final resurrection of the dead, which would happen at the end of time. So when Jesus said, Lazarus will rise, she repeated that what she'd already been told about resurrection. She, she knew that line. She'd learned it in synagogue school. Yeah, yeah, I know that he'll be raised on the last day. That someday, at the end of time, there'll be a general resurrection of the dead. But Jesus said, no, Martha. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about that kind of resurrection. I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, though they die, will live. It seems here that Jesus is not denying Martha's ideas about a future resurrection, but instead Jesus, as he's 
always does in John's gospel. He takes the, whole, the conversation to a whole new level, to the level of his identity with God. Now, Old Testament faith claimed God as a power over life and death. And what's radical in what Jesus says in John's gospel is that God now shares that power with him. In Christ, we see God's hopes, God's intentions for the world, and we see those hopes and intentions at work in the world. Christ marks the coming of God's new age, the age in which God's hope for the world takes on a present-day reality. Martha hoped for a future resurrection and believed it as a promise of God, and Jesus said, that promise is not just a down-the-road, end-of-time thing. No, it's a present reality. Resurrection is here, and it is now. What God wills and hopes for the world is somehow visible in Jesus. That is, the defeat of death's power to remove people from life with God. Who Jesus is, what Jesus does, marks a shift in understanding of our relationship with the sacred and the divine in the world. John makes the claim here about Jesus' identity and who God is, Jesus is, in some mysterious way. God's promise to defeat death somehow comes alive in Jesus. And the power of the divine, of the sacred in the world, the power of Christ in the world, is a power that defeats death, not just at an end-of-time reality, but also in the here and in the now. It's not just a future thing, it's a present thing. All of a sudden, resurrection is a present reality. So if you look at the story from this perspective, the divine power is not only the power to raise the dead, but it is also the power to give new life. It's not just the power to raise the dead, it's also the power to give new life. Resurrection can be a metaphor for being raised in the here and in the now. Let's look at what Jesus says about this. He says, two things, two lines I want to look at. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. The second line is, everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Now, this is a really interesting couple of sentences here because the first part, those who believe in me, even though they die, will live, is about the effect that Jesus has on the believer's death. Even though they die, they will live. Maybe this is a reference to that Pharisaic understanding of the general resurrection at the end of time. But the second statement is not synonymous with the first. Everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. The focus of this statement seems to be the effect that Jesus has on the believer's life. It's a here and now thing. It reaches into the future and brings this idea of resurrection from the future and plants it firmly in the present, in the here and in the now. This idea, this metaphor of resurrection is not just a future thing. It's a metaphor of what happens to us or what can happen to us, to we who are living. In fact, I think of this story, this whole beautiful, rich, inspired story as a metaphorical narrative, the whole thing. It's intended to help us, as hearers of the story, let go of our fixation on an afterlife or the idea of a literal resurrection and begin to see that resurrection can be a metaphor, something which helps us to think about the reality of transformation, sacred transformation in the here 
and in the now. And to call that resurrection. Resurrection can be a metaphor for new life. Not just after we die, but also right now. That day in Bethany, in the middle of a community stung by grief, Jesus did just that. He brought Martha to the stunning recognition that resurrection, i.e. new life, is also about now. Because resurrection was not just a gift to Lazarus, who really wasn't resurrected. He was resuscitated because he eventually died again. Resurrection was not just a gift to Lazarus, it was also a gift to Martha because she found a new kind of life. This story could be a beautiful parable which points to this twofold hope. It takes the idea of literal resurrection and, as a powerful metaphor, helps us to claim that power in our life today. Both of these things. We don't need to live in fear of the inevitable power of death because as Jesus reveals, we have a relationship, a full relationship with God who is the power of life. Our future is determined by life, not by any kind of death. Whenever Jesus arrives, to those of us who are dead on the inside, we are set loose. We dead, right here, right now, in this room, we dead are set loose. We're brought to life. Listen to a story. Ezekiel had a vision. And before we get to that vision, it might be helpful to know a little bit more about Mr. Ezekiel. He lived during the days of the Babylonian exile. In 587 BC, the Babylonian army smashed through the gates of Jerusalem, plundered the city mercilessly, and dragged anyone of any importance back to the city of Babylon where they could be kept from being troublemakers. These were among the saddest days in the history of the Israelite people. They'd been ripped from their homeland, their way of life, their temple, and there they sat by the rivers of Babylon and they wept as they remembered Zion, remembered Jerusalem. The Tigris and the Euphrates rivers flowed, but the people of God felt dry, 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 bone dry. Then came the gift. Then came the vision. Ezekiel dreamed he was in a valley filled with death, with dry bones. And before he knew it, the breath of God blew through that place of decay and people were born again. Look at these living people, God said to Ezekiel. I'm going to do with the Israelites what I've done with these bones. But I'm going to do it while you are still alive. And your resurrection is going to look like this. I'm going to take you out from this land of death in Babylon and I'm going to return you to a place that you can call home where you can build a temple and you can live in homes and you can have families. I'm going to give you new meaning in life. I'm going to breathe my breath into you. I'm going to restore you as my people. I'm going to resurrect you. A beautiful metaphor The God who can breathe life into dead bones surely should be able to breathe life into living ones. Listen to another story. Her husband left her. She went through a divorce. She had great difficulty with her children. She was able to reconcile with them mostly. At one point, she had to file for bankruptcy because of poor decisions she'd made. AA and her church friends helped her back the long, hard way. Her children are still wounded, and the hard days are really hard. 
But today, when she speaks about God, people listen. And when they ask, how have you managed? She replies, with a lot of help from God's Spirit. Isn't that resurrection? Isn't that new life in the here and in the now? Something tells me you have a resurrection story. You know, maybe your story is less dramatic than the one I've just told. Maybe it's more dramatic. But you have a new life story. Everyone does. You just need to notice it. Maybe you're in the midst right now of a new life story. Maybe you are living it. A time when you have or are coming out of a tomb of some kind. Maybe a tomb of your own making. Maybe a tomb that somebody else has tried to put you in. But you're going to come out of that tomb. Any story where Jesus walks onto the scene and sends the power of death a fleeting once resurrection is let loose, then that life-giving, mysterious thing that God does so well, it happens all over again. The times when death seems to trap us in mind and body and spirit, when it feels like that fourth-day spirit has left us for good, that's little more than an excuse for Jesus to walk onto the scene and once again do what he does best. Maybe it's good that we didn't wait until Easter Sunday to proclaim this message of the power of God. The power of God to breathe resurrection into people, into all creation, to breathe life into the dead and the living. Because God cannot wait. God will not wait to do such a thing. In the midst of many of experiences of each of us 
perhaps of fear or grief or loss or death. Thank you, Hugh, for your message of new life, reminding us that resurrection happens each day and that God's spirit and the breath of God breathes into us and gives us hope and new life each day. We have many things to look forward to over the next week. Today, after worship, there is a hot dog lunch um, out in the hall that Carol and the youth have prepared, and it is in support of the PWS&D appeal um, to support the needs in Syria and Turkey after the earthquake. So we hope that you will all join us for this time of food and fellowship. Tonight, we look forward to a young adult gathering upstairs in room 205. We, ironically, or I guess in some ways planned, we are talking a little bit about um, salvation and what abundant life means now, not just about what happens in heaven or in the afterlife, but how um, that new life can happen for us each day. And this gathering of young adults is growing all the time. If this sounds curious to you, um, there's always someone new that comes out every month. And so we invite you to come to bring friends and it's great conversation, some food and some fellowship. So we hope to see you there. There is a financial update that went out in this week at Knox or is up on the screen now. We invite you to pay attention to this. We thank you so much for your generous offerings and um, there is some more information about the details of that for you to look at. We are already looking ahead to the summer and vacation Bible camp registration has begun. We had a planning meeting earlier this week and I'm quite excited about the theme of Change Makers Lab this summer and all the people that are being involved. We're already starting to organize um, leaders and volunteers and registrations are coming in and so that's July the 10th to 14th in the mornings and so if you're interested in volunteering for part or all of the week or you want to sign up your children or grandchildren or nieces or nephews or neighbors please reach out to carol or myself we look forward to next sunday it's hard to believe that holy week begins next sunday on palm sunday and we are having an intergenerational worship service there will be no sunday school and everyone will be worshiping in at the sanctuary together. We'll have our prayer ground set up at the front again. All ages will be involved in leading the story and music in worship. We have a Logos group sharing music. There's going to be a drama telling of the scripture and lots of interactive activities uh, for all ages. So we look forward to having you share in part of this service. In this season, God's voice through the scriptures questions us not to test so much as to challenge us and to uh, inspire us to more. What will we offer in response? And so as the offering plates come around to you in this time and we reflect and hear music, you are invited to contemplate what you are offer, will offer and the different ways you can offer yourself, your time, and your treasures to this community of faith, to building it up, to pouring new life and new breath into this community. There are lots of ways to give through PAC, through physical money in the offering plates, through e-transfer through credit card and so don't let anything stop you from giving and giving of yourself too. Let us receive our offerings.
please be seated. As we pray today, um, at the end of each stanza, there will be a response. So as I say, Spirit of God, I invite the congregation to respond and say, breathe new life in us. So Spirit of God, let us pray. Life-giving God, like Martha, Mary, and Lazarus, we are loved by you. We think of this family and the way they open their home to others, providing care and companionship to Jesus and his friends. We pray for our homes, that they may be places where others can find life-giving relationships. Spirit of God, breathe new life in us. Just like Martha, Mary, and Lazarus, we are different from one another. Martha was practical and clear about what she believed. Thank you for those who use their skills and ability to care for others. We pray that their faithfulness and dependability will bring hope to those who are not sure about their faith and find it hard to believe in you and in other people. Spirit of God, Breathe new life in us. Mary loved deeply and felt the pain of loss and desertion. We pray for those who have experienced loss of those they love, those for whom relationships have brought disappointment, those whose trust has not been honored. May they find comfort in their sadness and courage to reach out again to others. Spirit of God, in us. Lazarus had faced illness and death. Pray for all who face life-threatening illnesses or injuries, those paralyzed by fear or anxiety, those for whom depression or difficulties make life painful or seem like not worth living. Help us all to face our mortality, knowing that there are limits to our energy and that there will be an end to our life and strength, but never an end to your loving presence. Spirit of God, breathe new life in us. In a short time of silence, we bring our prayers to a God. As we finish this time of prayer, we ask, Spirit of God, breathe new life in us. And God's people say, Amen. Let us join together in our closing hymn, number 787, The Kingdom of God is Justice and Joy.
is under our feet, like a roof, God is over our heads, like the horizon, God is beyond us, like water in a pitcher, God is in us and in the pouring out of us, like a pebble in the sea, we are in God. As God has brought transformation, resurrection, grace to your life today, Go now and offer the same gifts to the world. I'm Hugh Donnelly, one of the ministers at Knox Waterloo. Thank you for being a part of the worshiping community today. You can find us online at knoxwaterloo.ca and you are always welcome to call us at 519-886-4150. This broadcast is made possible by you, listeners and friends of Knox who support Knox's broadcast ministry. Please consider making a donation in gratitude as you are able, and may the peace of Christ be with you.